four, three, two, one. Religion and politics and the new moral majority. We'll be talking about that in a moment on To the Point. To the Point. Presented by Rice University. Hello, my name is Thad Pugh, and welcome to To the Point. Today our guest is Dr. Niels Nielsen, who is the Razor Professor of Philosophy and Religious Thought here at Rice University and also Chairman of our Department of Religious Studies. Welcome to the show, Dr. Nielsen. Thank you. Uh, recently, there has been increased visibility uh, on the part of a new uh, moral majority is what it's being called. It's a, it's a religious component, and they are particularly politically active. Who, who, are, who is the moral majority? Well, um, I think one identifies this immediately with Jerry Falwell of um, um, Independent Baptist Minister in Lynchburg, Virginia. But there are other contexts that have to be, um, be brought into the picture. Um, there's a whole spectrum here of religious opinion and activity uh, on the far right, um, called evangelical sometimes, but in this case more particularly fundamentalist, that in general has been quietistic. This type of Christianity, a kind of born-again Christianity, has been more interested in, in uh, personal conversion, the idea that if one has a good man, one will have a good government. Uh, this group has now become, uh, especially in the presidential campaign, uh, very active, identifying issues, uh, speaking out um, on issues in certain situations and by implications for particular candidates. What are some of the issues that, that this group chooses to support? Well, Jerry Falwell says that particularly the Supreme Court decision uh, about prayers in the public schools was one that uh, set him in the direction that he's going. Um, they're interested in issues uh, such as abortion, um, the Equal Rights Amendment they're opposing, um, questions like uh, armaments, a strong America, the role of uh, homosexuals. All these are, are issues on which they're identifying a single Christian position and lobbying very strongly, very practically, very actively uh, for this kind of position. It comes out in giving a, a rating, a voting record rating to particular congressmen, this kind of thing. Who is supporting or falling behind the leaders of this movement? Are they taking uh, members of the traditional mainstream churches? Is that where they find their following? Well, um, this movement centers particularly around a uh, um, given range of uh, radio and television evangelists. It does not include all the major evangelists. People like Billy Graham have not been involved. Oral Roberts has not been visible. Uh, but um, uh, Robertson and Robinson and Falwell and others uh, have a certain constituency. I think it's important not to overestimate the size of the constituency. Uh, it's estimated that some of these radio preachers have viewers numbering 16, 18 million. I think the figure is probably closer to 6 to 8 million. And uh, it's a group that's talking um, uh, to a very considerable extent uh, to its own constituency. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, one has to say that um, in a close election, whether it's a congressional election or whether it's um, a national presidential election, this is a group enough, large enough, that in a very close election, uh, it could make a, a significant kind of difference. Professor Martin, my colleague here at Rice, estimates that in five out of eight of the last presidential election, the vote was close enough that, that um, this size constituency could make a difference. How did the issues that were uh, articulated by this group play a part in this past election? Well, um, certainly um, um, particular candidates have, have, um, have given um, um, the nod to this particular group. Uh, Mr. Falwell has been in on certain um, um, convention activities. Um, the groups are careful to say that they, they don't want to simply lobby for particular candidates because um, 
there's always a danger of losing tax-free privileges that, that go to a religious group. What's really happening is I think the whole relation of church and state is, is coming out again. I should say that uh, certainly groups like this ought to be at liberty in a free democratic society to raise issues, to speak to questions. I think it's safe to say that the kind of thing is represented by moral majority and Christian voice, other groups associated with them, are speaking to issues that concern a certain spectrum of people in our society. And in a democratic society, it's necessary that, um, that these opinions uh, be voiced. On the other hand, in America, we have avoided clericalism. That is to say, the direct intervention of um, religious functionaries in the political life. Uh, clericalism is a kind of thing that curses other societies where a church is established. Um, in these kinds of circumstances, you get the counterpart anti-clericalism. And there are certain real dangers, I think, that one recognizes in a society where there's separation of church and state by rather direct involvement of religious functionaries in the political process. From what you said, I see that the moral majority is really not a majority, but is there a chance of, of that coming to, to be so, and if, and if so, how, how will it be brought about by these radio evangelists, the well, television um, evangelists? I, I think one must not overestimate uh, the size of the constituency of, of these groups. Um, whatever one thinks of them, positively or negatively, uh, it is necessary to, to make a fair kind of evaluation. They don't represent the constituency of the mainline denominations. There was a time after World War II when um, the phenomenon of radio evangelism was not so large. Um, indeed, it, time was not available on many networks to them. Um, these are groups that are vigorous and active and buying their, their own time and therefore have a place. The Nielsen ratings on many of these evangelists that are involved in this kind of situation show that on particular stations they have had a decreasing audience for the last two or three years. Some of them increase their spread by taking on more stations. But um, this is a constituency whose... Um, size, just to be fair about it, ought not to be um, uh, overestimated. It's a group that's active and, and uh, talking to its, its, its own constituency. On the other hand, I'd want to be very clear that I think in an open democratic society, not a closed society, it's important that groups that have opinions, um, wherever they stand in the spectrum of American political thought, um, are free to express it, ought to be free to express it. What are some of the precedents of, of uh, religious activism in, in, in politics? Well, um, we've had an interesting phenomena in the United States since the time of Harry Truman, uh, which has involved, uh, in particular, evangelist Billy Graham, I think out of very sincere and earnest motives, uh, was a kind of an informal chaplain to Presidents uh, Eisenhower and Johnson, and um, uh, then to Nixon. And Mr. Graham has not been as much involved in politics since the Nixon affair. I think he recognizes now um, the dangers and, and the limits of his own involvement with Nixon, endorsing Nixon almost to the end in the whole Vietnam affair. And uh, Billy Graham in particular has, has realized it's necessary for a religious functionary to distance himself somewhat from politics. It's a fascinating kind of business because uh, Mr. Carter certainly introduced the born-again issue uh, into the political campaign. I think that's not quite fair to say that he introduced it. The press evoked a particular kind of response or commitment on Mr. Carter's part, which I think is a sincere and honest one. At any rate, his born-againness spoke for his character in the last election campaign. And um, all three uh, candidates, Ronald Reagan and Anderson and Carter, all claimed a born-again experience. That's a kind of a personal thing. We're now having religious groups involved in the social process, identifying particular specific kinds of issues. What about, for instance, Martin Luther King? Now, that was a great religious leader. He was also a great civic leader, too. How, how did those two get intertwine there. Yeah, um, certainly, he, he began his, his, his political philosophy in, from the pulpit, so to speak. 
Yeah, um, I think um, that um, it's a different side of the spectrum that Martin Luther King uh, came from. And uh, he was raising one particular issue, the issue of racial discrimination. Um, it was a, um, assuredly a political kind of activism, but um, one that um, um, by its very nature um, had um, different, kinds of, um, uh, different kinds of goals. What we have involved now, I think, in, in the activities in the last presidential election is a rather sophisticated kind of political realism that identifies a whole range of issues and then evaluates a particular candidates, particular congressmen, uh, as to whether they, they meet uh, the criterions of this particular group, the point at which um, the moral majority and the groups associated with it have received uh, criticism in the conservative evangelical press. I don't mean the, the liberal or the mainstream press, but in the conservative evangelical press has been the identification with single issues, the insistence that there is only one Christian position on particular issues. And uh, I think more sophisticated uh, political analysts recognize that, that politics is not a single um, uh, issue business. Uh, when one comes to something like a position on, on war, uh, the issues are, are, um, are very complex. That's not a way of avoiding the issues, but to say simply what any practicing politician or statesman, if that's what he is, has to recognize. And the danger, of course, is of oversimplistic solutions, specifically. If we return to God, if we pray, um, then all our problems of foreign affairs, the economy, inflation, etc., uh, will be alleviated. And uh, probably uh, practicing politicians who are more realistic, or if one wants the word more cynical, uh, have and can and probably will manipulate and use idealistic, including uh, sincerely religious people. We've been talking quite a bit about how the moral majority has had an effect on politics. How about how the moral majority has had an effect on religion itself? Well, um, certainly because there's a radio and television approach, they reach into the, um, into the regular constituencies. But I think there's one factor that has yet to be evaluated. Um, groups like this also produce um, counter-results. And I don't mean this simply in an evaluative kind of way as a judgment against them, but simply to try and say what goes on. It's not clear that the so-called evangelical community uh, is a unity, and it's not clear that um, the kind of leadership that's attempted to come from certain quarters uh, will not um, um, meet with, a, um, with a, um, a counter kind of reaction. On the other hand, I think what has to be said in conclusion is that a whole range of us in American society are terribly concerned about moral issues. And um, the whole place of values and ethics in American society is being come at by very earnest people uh, all the way since the, um, the affair of Watergate. But um, unfortunately, um, there are other approaches to, um, to um, to moral questions than, than a single, um, single issue a kind of approach. Then would you say that the recent political situation, now talking about the, the way politics has had an effect on this group, mm -hmm. uh, has, has made the times ripe for this type of group to come into being as far as... Yeah, you know, I think the whole uh, crisis in the, um, in, the, um, in the modern world and um, a certain kind of moral vacuum that at times presents itself in a secular society um, have made themselves um, uh, ripe. Uh, the danger, of course, is always expecting too much of a political candidate, be he any candidate. The danger is always too much of utopianism. And we have a wonderful tradition of the separation of church and state in America. Now, there are great positive values that have come to that. And because people that have apolitical now become politicized, doesn't mean we should abrogate this tradition of separation of church and state, which has been one of the richest and most successful aspects of the American heritage. Thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Nelson. Uh, this is Thad Pugh for To The Point, a radio show pre presented by Rice University. Thank you for listening.
To the Point is produced by Information Services in the Language Lab at Rice University.